because it's our children. I'm speaking as a great grandfather. When I see this young man that's in this room today, I feel safe in knowing that my great grandson will have someone to look up to instead of his great grandfather that was in force of one of the gangs in the city of Chicago. My name is Howard Wooldridge, I'm a retired police detective from Fort Worth, Texas, co-founder of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I have a question for my colleague, Major Green. Uh, I've been on the Hill now for three years uh, advocating to end the war on drugs, modern prohibition, and my best information would agree with Mr. Brown that our profession is in this strictly for the money. We know that law enforcement receives $72 billion a year to enforce the drug war, the modern prohibition. And as Jim Pasco, the head of the FOP, told me, he's looking out for the membership and the paychecks of 326,000 members of the FOP. I'd be a proud member of the FOP when I was a police officer. My question is, I've been out of this for 14 years. I've been in a coffee shop in 14 years. And at that time, we never even discussed the war on drugs and the possibility of ending it. It's kind of like the Berlin Wall. It was always there, always would be. Today, through LEAP, uh, I know Nobles have taken some steps in that, that direction. What are the troops back at the coffee shop saying about the war on drugs? Is anybody really defending it, saying it's a good idea, we should keep it going uh, in, in terms of our, our profession? Because as you know, it hurts us tremendously in terms of public perception. We've gone from protect and serve to uh, search and arrest. Uh, what, is, what are the uh, current thoughts back at the, at the coffee shop, sir? <laughs> I guess that'd be a donut and coffee shop. <laughs> I don't drink coffee, donuts. Um, it, you know, the war on drugs is, is just that. I mean, it it, it is a fight uh, because um, many times people are substance abusers and they get caught in a trap. I, I, I'm reminded of a young lady. Um, you know, who had a small amount of drugs in her possession and ended up getting 20 years in federal uh, jail. Um, so, you know, there, there's some things being looked at right now as far as looking at the amount of weight of crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. There's just it's a lot of information going on right now, but I do know that um, there is a fight, there is a war, and we need to continue to wage the war, but just in a, in a different kind of way. We need to be cognizant and, and aware that people who use drugs are substance abusers. My, my father was an alcoholic, and because he made some very bad decisions, you know, it doesn't mean that, you know, if you kind of drunk, you need to go to the penitentiary. So we need to come up with solutions that help people rid themselves of drugs more so than looking for ways to put people in jail for 20, 30, and 40 years because they've been caught in possession of drugs. It's a, it's a booming market out there for, for people to, to make a lot of money off of drugs. Um, I believe that if they're given other opportunities, uh, other ways to live their lives, they may seriously take that into consideration. She's allowing me to uh, respond to Gator. Uh, Reverend, for just a second to understand, I know this man. He was one of the most powerful individuals in Chicago, among three or four of the most powerful individuals. We had to target him and those other individuals to be able to do anything in Chicago. He changed his life around. Three or four other individuals with tremendous negative power changed their lives around. They did more than any organization in this country could have ever done in stopping violence, saving lives, and, and bringing crime down. So as a perfect example, I did not bring him here. Right. <laughs> he was with me. I saw him outside. He is here. Now, let me just suppose and move over for a minute for you. Uh, in Los Angeles, uh, we have had peace treaties created by community individuals that changed their lives around. When he's talking about being a grandfather, he's talking about taking care of those babies I was telling you about earlier, those individuals who changed their lives around. Now, as we sit here, we feel that we're advanced 
of what this situation is all about when we respect it. We know the solution. Mm -hmm. We have the systems in place. Mm -hmm. And as he said, and he didn't know I was thinking this, we're going to try to get to the president one day and say, mm -hmm. look, here's 200 individuals from across the country that's willing to serve you. Mm -hmm. We have the system. We have the methodology. All right. we need are the resources. Right. And that's exactly what's happening at this particular point. So we to thank you for your comments and thank you for the work that you have done thank you. over the years. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we take the next question, go ahead, please, please. I said NOVA was one of the first law enforcement organizations to come on board. Um, Peace in the Hood out of Cleveland, Ohio. United in Peace Incorporated out of Chicago. They got colleagues in Pennsylvania, in Louisiana, in Florida, in California. Any place we needed to have some folks on the ground making phone calls to some senator, some congressman. These individuals, these brothers that you're talking about, have been the ones to step up and make that happen. And they really are the best kept secret in the, in the so-called, I ain't gonna call it a war, it's not a war. They are the best kept secret into reducing all this gang and youth violence that we have going on across the nation. And, 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 and we welcome them to the fray, but we also are taking our cues from them um, about how best to, to make this happen and, and, and accomplish what we all want to accomplish. Yes, sir. Uh, Solomon Graves, I'm from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. I kind of approach things from a different pers perspective. I'm the uh, Special Projects Coordinator for the Arkansas Pro Board, um, having worked in corrections for uh, going on six years now. Um, for the panel, what types of resources as a system can we start providing those young men, those young girls who we can't initially reach, who do have to come inside our walls from a programmatic perspective that we can hopefully reduce our um, recidivism rates in Arkansas. We have an adult recidivism rate of approaching 50%. Um, you go to some states, it's upwards of 60. Um, so as, as a field, what can we do to uh, present a better product to hopefully lower our recidivism rates? Because we don't have a problem incarcerating anybody. The issues we're having is we're incarcerating the wrong people. We have men and women who are nonviolent first-time offenders who come in and, as you said, get 20 years sentences on a first-time dope, dope charge. I saw a guy get 40 years. Um, we have people who come back not because they're criminals, but because they just make wrong choices. So what can we do as a system to give them those, those skill sets while they are in our care and custody to hopefully um, change those um, uh, uh, negative behaviors? Let me make uh, one comment on that. The first thing you have to do is decide you want to do something. And that's not that's not that flippant a uh, an answer because all of the second chance programs have been studied. When you invest in second chance, there's, there's very little that you can do that won't save more money than you spend in re in reducing recidivism. I mean, it's just hard. I mean, you could steal half the money, raise ha waste half the rest and still reduce recidivism in a cost-effective manner. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is just decide. And once you've decided that you're going to do something evidence-based, not slogan-based, not political-based, the answers are all, all the research is there. And it's just, this is not complicated. The complicated part is making the choice. Either we're going to reduce crime or we're going to play politics. Once you have made the decision, then the rest is easy. And if you choose right, not only are you going to reduce crime, you're going to save more money than you spend. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, very, it's just very difficult to even to, to conceive of programs that don't save more money than they spend. So on, on second to the people in the program, first decide that we're going to, in a cost-effective way, reduce crime. And then the research is just all over the place. But you have to first make that decision. I also think that it, it, it is also an attitude um, among the people who sit on the bench and who are um, facilitating the probation and parole systems. You know, I can only speak from the juvenile perspective, but it has to be a conscious decision. It had to have been a conscious decision on my part that I was going to be proactive on reducing recidivism. And to get it down, to single digit 
in one of the largest juvenile court systems in the country. And I don't say that to pat myself on the back. That was a lot of work and a lot of arrows because people frankly moved to try to get me put off the bench mm. because they took the attitude that I was coddling these juveniles. I was not coddling the juveniles. I was holding them accountable in a way. And I had no problem saying, if you come back in here, there's going to be hell to pay. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a problem. When it was necessary, I locked up a lot of kids. But I did it as a last resort when I felt that I had tried other alternatives. But it meant a collaborative effort with faith-based organizations in my community. I had to call Reverend so-and-so and say, you know, Sister so-and-so's child, I had to get permission to be able because of confidentiality, say Sister so-and-so's child, I, you know, I need some men in that congregation to get around this kid. You know, my mama used to supervise kids in the soup kitchen at the church. You know, I mean, I'm being overly simplistic to make the point that it has to be in the DNA and that it has to be a collaborative effort that moves outside the walls of the penal and justice system to say that I need the Urban League to do some job training for so-and-so's father so that when I send him home, that there will be some stability in that home. So you really have to think of it as these <clears throat> incredible partnerships of people coming in and I used to have more lunches at the juvenile court and bringing in groups because I said the juvenile court has to belong to this entire community because I cannot fight this battle by myself. And if there is an intentional piece that we're going to work on recidivism and have resources on the back end when they're out of the system, which is exactly what we're talking about in terms of making this shift, then if we're saying to the school system, I want him back, I want her back in school, and I need some remedial pieces because the kid's been out of school for dang gone, you know, 18 months. You know, and we're gonna put him, I'm gonna order him back in the classroom, and there's no support system for him. I am setting him up to fail. So as a piece of this, I started this truancy intervention project, and it's not about me, I'm just sharing with you things that have worked in my community. We have now exported to a lot of other places in the country. I'm proud to say that the D.C. public school system is the newest school system to sign on to this truancy intervention project. Because we know if our kids are not in school, they are not home reading Langston Hughes. <laughs> they're not. They're not home. You know, I mean, come on, let's get real about this. When they're not in school, they are very likely to be out doing the same things that Major Green and all of his allies are out having to police. They are breaking into your house while you at work. They're still in your car. They're, you know, they're harassing the senior citizens as they know because they got their check. You see what I'm saying? And so the Truancy Intervention Project said to the school system, you know these kids aren't in school. Why aren't we being more proactive? And what I did is I recruited lawyers, which I'm very proud of. We recruited a team of lawyers, then we recruited paralegals, then we recruited any human warm, interested body to start tutoring these kids. And I'm going to tell you that the attendance rate turned around dramatically. The recidivism rate dropped significantly because the point at the end of the day is that they knew somebody was watching. And that is what we do. So if you want more information on this truancy project, it's TIP, T-I-P dot org. It's a truancy intervention project. It is run, still run out of juvenile court, Fulton County, Georgia. And Jessica Pennington is the executive director and they're happy to share information, you know, it's not something unique to us, and again, I'm glad that a number of other cities have picked it up. That one thing is not the silver bullet, but that we know that one thing has dramatically changed the conversation, and that's what we're talking about, dramatically changing these conversations. A kid who drops out of school is three and a half times more likely to have a criminal record 
than a child who finishes school. If we know that, then we got to do a better job of getting our kids off the street in our classrooms, but when we get them in the classrooms, we got to do a better job of keeping them there. Don't get me started on that now. <laughs> and educating them, because we've got to break that cycle. They're seven times more likely to have, um, to be dependent on welfare in their lifetime, and seven times more likely to have a child who will then become truant. Truancy is the number one predictor, number one, hear me, that a child is going to have a criminal record. If we know that, we've got to break that cycle. Right. And that's a, key to, key, a big key to resilience. I hate to have to uh, speak so much and try to make myself out to be a know-it-all, but the whole concept of recidivism is being misrepresented. It is very difficult to track a person and say that they're recidivists. You need money to do it, you need a program to do it, and in most cases, you can't get the money to do it, okay? The issue is that recidivism is a political term. Yeah, yeah. It's a political term. Life management skills is the key to an individual taking responsibility for their own actions. And when you teach life management skills, you deal with problem solving, decision making, you deal with economic development, you deal with family relationships, you deal holistic with all of those things that a person has to apply to become a person on the road to success. We say success is not a destination, it's a journey. Mm. So in America, that curriculum is a Bible, 15 chapters, eight critical areas that is taught across the board. Across the board, <coughs> without that curriculum, we could not do it. Let me give you an example of recidivism. We have an individual that committed a crime, comes out of jail, goes back into the community. A policeman finds him in a house that has a gun in it that doesn't belong to him. He's a violation, so he goes back. He's a recidivist. You have an individual who's now doing gang intervention work because he's come out of prison, and he's hanging out with some gang members trying to get them to do right. Because he's hanging out with gang members, he's a recidivist, he goes back. So the recidivism doesn't tell you the story. What you have to do is get an individual to change their thinking. Mm -hmm. And you do that through education. And when they change their thinking, they take responsibility for themselves. Now, the support system that everybody's talking about is absolutely necessary. The mentorship, the family relationship, all of those other things are very, very vital. But if you don't understand, there is, you have to get away from the system. Because the system deals with quantitative data, it deals with numbers, and in human development, it is the change of a person thinking. And it doesn't always come out in numbers. In selling cars, it does come out in numbers. <laughs> so in America, we have individuals that have changed their lives, who are living as law-abiding citizens, and who feel good about it, that we don't have to discipline, because they've, they've found that self-discipline is what they use. So I say that to you, not as a know-it-all, but as a person that is sitting here with an example of everything that I tell you. Everything that I say to you today is in action. Recidivism is a tremendous cost. It is a trick situation, because if they give you a contract and you say you're going to cut down recidivism, they know that without you getting in those files and without a lot of extra money, you're not going to be able to do it on a scientific level. Thank you. Before we take the next question, just to answer. Um, before I was doing juvenile work on the national level, I was doing where am I, where am I, questioning? I was doing um, adult um, criminal justice reform level on the Maryland level until um, on the state level, and Mr. Scott's point that you really just have to decide that that's what you're going to do. Um, I watched um, Maryland is a very blue state, very heavily Democrat. We always go Democrat. Um, but a fluke happened back in uh, 2002, and we elected our first uh, Republican governor since Spiro Agnew. Well, that Republican governor ended up naming to the Department of Public Safety a Democrat who's pretty progressive on prison, on prison reform issues. On prison reform issues. Um, I watched Democrats torpedo 
-hmm. an effective prisoner reentry program right. because it was being advocated for by Republican government. You have to decide that's what you're going to do. Politics don't enter the <coughs> equation. You, there is no program on the reentry side that has been shown to fail. <laughs> right. Some of them are more successful than others, but all of them have some sort of impact. So it really doesn't matter what you do, you just got to find it and do it and do it consistently. I want to welcome to the panel um, Dr. Charles Ogletree. Thank you so much for coming. We do have folks um, lined up on the wall, but if you could just hold for a moment, because I want to give Dr. Ogletree an opportunity to speak with us, and then we're going to open it up for um, questions, and it looks like, Dr. Oldershire, before you begin, we need to say goodbye to Mr. Brown, this is our show, we ain't like this. assume that someone, uh, that, that we can decide our friends because they're Democrats or Republicans. On this issue, we have seen uh, abysmal failure on the part of people, even within a party that you think would be concerned about this. And the problem is not a Southern problem, it's a national problem. And the problem is not conservatives, it's people who are usually right-thinking progressive forces who have been exactly in the wrong place when you talk about trying to deal with the problem of, of young people. And that's why when we first heard that Congressman Bobby, Bobby Scott was talking about uh, the Youth Commons Act, uh, our institute, the Charles Hunt Institute for Race and Justice, uh, wrote a pretty substantial report called uh, Leave uh, No More Children Left Behind Bars. It's available on our website, charleshumphuston.org. It, it, uh, it assesses all the data, all the empirical data, all the reports. And the point is very simple. Incarceration doesn't work. Punishment doesn't work. Uh, treatment, prevention, all those things are essential. And you're hearing this not just from the people who are social workers, but from probation, parole, police, the whole corrections and law enforcement industry, because they understand that we're, we're, it's costing us money to do the uh, silly way of responding to crime. And the reality, it's not being tough on crime, it's being smart about criminal prevention, crime prevention. And that's what our No More Children Left Behind Bars is all about. And we have been uh, very uh, astute supporters of the Youth Promise Act because that's exactly what it is. Uh, and uh, I, I have been uh, congratulating Jim Brown for all the work that he does with gangs, but it's too late. Right? It's great that someone's there taking time to work with gangs and gang members, and we should do that. But we could have helped these young men, largely African-American men, generations earlier by having a caring family, a teacher, a community, and the one thing I want to say is that, and maybe it's been discussed, and Judge Hatchett can tell you that, it's not just the punishment when you're uh, determined to be a delinquent. It's the collateral consequences of what you've done. That is, now our system is so much in the wrong direction that the whole idea of citizenship is lost with many of our children. What I mean by that, they can't go to school. And you've probably heard already, they're dropping out of eighth grade, not because they're failing school, but if they can't pass these comprehensive standard tests, they're saying, why should I stand to 10th grade and 12th grade? Nothing I can do is going to get me to diploma. They told me in 4th grade. They told me to get in 8th grade. So why should I stay? So don't look at the data and think that every child dropping out of school is because they're a delinquent or a truant or a troublemaker. Some of them are saying, I don't see a way out. And I'm not violent. I'm not committing crimes. I'm not selling drugs. But the school system isn't working for me, and we have to fix it. When they go through the juvenile justice system, they get promoted to the adult system, they lose the right to vote in many places. They lose the right to, uh, in Massachusetts, to have a driver's license. If you have a drug offense, not a driving offense, but a drug offense means you can use your uh, uh, driver's license. Health benefits are impacted by uh, the correction system. Uh, and and uh, housing, 
the ability to stay in housing, getting student loans. I mean, every single thing, people have been punished seven and eight or nine or ten times for the single uh, mistake they made in their lives. And part of what this Youth Promise Act does is focuses on prevention, treatment, and the future. Judge Arthur Burnett, who I hope you guys have met, who should be up here, has been doing this kind of work for a very long time uh, as a judge and now runs an entire organization. So anybody here with a community-based organization, see him. Talk to him. Hear Let's somebody. So Judge Burnett, please stand up so they can see who you are. This man has said the real soldier in the field. I just saw him last week in Oklahoma, I think. I'll probably see him next week in uh, New Mexico, wherever. But he's on the road pleading uh, with our drug penalties. And the other point, we've got friends. Uh, it, it, and that's why the, the idea of Republican Democrat is, is irrelevant. But let me just say a word about friends. One of the uh, fairest and toughest judges I've ever met, and I'm glad I never lost a trial in front of him, is Judge Reggie Walton. He was a former prosecutor in Philadelphia. He was a public defender. Uh, he was a prosecutor in Mass and, and, and here in D.C., Judge Burnett knows him. Uh, and he's a judge. He was a Supreme Court judge. He was the crime czar under President Bush one. He now uh, is a federal district court judge. And he has said the criminal justice system is broken. Now, this is a conservative black federal judge. It's people like that. We don't, they don't have to be here testifying. But when they give testimony in Congress that say, look, I am a law and order guy. I lock people up. If they are convicted, convicted I'm going to give them the time that they deserve. But there's something wrong when you see so many people, young black men, in prisons around the country, and it has to be addressed. And all I'm saying is let's look out for people who are not our natural constituents and find out we have a lot of people who support the idea of a sane policy. The last thing I'll say is that uh, Senator Jim Webb has this uh, Criminal Justice Commission, which is important. That's not this. We, this tells us what we can do. This, there's no study needed. Right. Yeah. We've, we've studied this to death, yeah. so, and we've got support from both sides of the board. And so uh, the one thing that I've noticed, I've been on a lot of panels the last three days, and I have to say, he hasn't always been there at these panels, but the one person like John Conyers and like Maxine Waters who's been out there making sure that every single issue in the criminal justice system is addressed and who has been vigilant about it is Congressman Bobby Scott. We should thank him for what he's done. <laughs> Things that um, is the Dr. Ogletree's uh, students went to great lengths to study the two different bills, the um, Youth Promise Act and the Bad Bill. And there's one provision that uh, in that Bad Bill on gang definition that is not uh, most people wouldn't notice the significant si significance of this. It says that uh, to get defined as a gang member, you have to have committed a certain number of crimes. Committed. Does not say convicted. Uh, Dr. Ogletree, can you uh, talk a little bit about the significance of that and what it does uh, to the conduct of the trial and guilt by association? Oh, it's, it's enormously uh, important because uh, I don't know a lot of people who have not been falsely arrested. In fact, let me turn it the other way. I know a lot of people who have been falsely arrested. Uh, and Skip Gates, right? Skip Gates has been arrested, right? Uh, and I'm getting that expunged because he has a lawyer who can do that. But the reality is that a whole lot of people get upset when they get arrested, and it, it goes away uh, for the day, and they never come back to clean it up. It stays with you for life. And it's used actually as an aggravating factor when a judge decides to punish you. And, and here's what being smart on crime. There is a judge in Massachusetts, a federal judge, her name is Nancy Gertner. And she had a very common sense idea, which actually was brilliant. She had an African-American before her, and she looked at his list of arrests, about 11 of them. And most of those arrests didn't result in any convictions. Uh, and she said, you know, I can't punish you. I'm going to discount these. Uh, I'm going to consider these irrelevant in terms of the guidelines. And, but, and that's what every judge should do. But the idea that something's on your record is important, and this is the kind of the sloppy, well, I, I shouldn't say it's not sloppy language. It's intentional language to see this deceptive to the public eye. When you say committed a crime, that sounds serious. Serious. And I don't know a client I've had who hasn't said, uh, even when you are adjudicated, uh, Cynthia Robinson has said, oh, the charges were dropped. Well, if you plead guilty, the charges were dropped. They were just repackaged, 
right? And so we have to do the education. There's a, there's a, this is another thing of collateral consequence. Even when you are uh, acquitted uh, or when you are not charged, that arrest may still be there, and that's part of the, the uh, dangerous language that we discovered and pointed out that this bill makes no sense. It's punishing people not for their crimes, but for their color and their location. Right, they happen to be in these areas where it's more easy for that to happen. And those are the types of things that we have to resist. And I'm glad that Congressman Bobby Scott's uh, legislation, uh, I'm sure he's already told you who was at this hearing. I mean, the hearing that we had, these were the uh, unexpected uh, supporters of it because they're in the, in the, in, in the dungeons. They're, they're working on the streets. They're working with people who have all these problems. And they're saying, you know, the idea of punishment is wrong, treatment is right, uh, and uh, prevention is critical. And if we don't have those things, we don't have a sensible criminal justice system or a juvenile justice system. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Raymond Coates. I'm a native of Washington. I've spent 20, over 23 years of my life in prison. I've been home 10 years now. We're struggling, but it's, it's okay. I, I, first, I want to say, back y'all, just the fact of hearing you talk about me, concern about me, brings me to a conclusion like Mr. Brown said, that I need to be about me. And I need to think about my own community, what I've done, and how I can make it back. And I wanted to talk about youth violence. We need to talk to each other. They do not exist in a vacuum. It happens on the streets they live on. Their mothers are there, their uncles are there, their cousins are there. We need to have a conversation with our community. We need to talk to each other. It's never cool to see a kid that was still dead. It's not cool at all. Oh, ain't nothing gangster about it, ain't nothing street about it. That's just not right. I walk around in my community every day, and I tell you, dudes, man, you participate in Rwanda. We need to call it what it is. That's the slaughter of each other. That's Rwanda. And we need to say that to our, our own people. And I do respect the fact that systems need to change. And that's fine. But if we don't talk to each other, systems can't help us. When our lawyers and our doctors and our judges and our preachers don't live in our community, when you can't knock on your teacher's door, when you got a problem, when you can't run around the corner and hide in the church because the church is locked, We are not there. We are not there. And I do want to thank you. I do. But I'm telling you, man, this is fine. But to every one of us, walk out in the street and say something to these kids. Say something when they're cursing on the bus. When they say something. When I was little and I've been doing that all my life, the one thing I always learned, even as a kid, do not disrespect adults who don't curse around anybody smack you upside the head. We won't even say nothing to them. So if we are afraid of our kids, if we are afraid of them, we call them animals. We treat them like animals. What else are they going to do? This is very important. I really want to And the other thing I want to say is this. Out of all the time I've been in prison all my life, one guy said one phrase to me that made me realize, you know what, I'm going to try my hand at something different. And you know what he said? Man, I don't want to hear all that, all that. What is it that you want to do, and how can I help you do it? I was 32 years old when he said that. I was still doing time. I came home, I've been home ever since, trying to do what I want to do. And that brother was supporting me the whole time. Straight up. Thank you. I want to say something quickly, and Judge Hatchett has a question for you. I think you should also talk to the, uh, both Congressman Scott and Judge Burnett, because we need you. Because a lot of people come out, they're so angry, they're so frustrated, uh, they don't want to talk to anybody. And the fact that you're here at the convention center and talking about it is important to us to show people that people can come out. I know you have a hard time getting a job, I know you have a hard time getting a place to live and all that. But the whole idea is that there's a problem, the system is broken. And we need you to show what made it possible for you to navigate it. Because we can talk to a blue in the face, but I really do think having right. people like you who are getting out right. and saying, I'm not complaining about I'm not I'm not trying to redisguise my case or 
All I'm saying is that I'm living now. I'm living now. And, and we want to do what we can to help make you a, a, a citizen in a real way. Thank you. Judge Yeah, I, um, and, and I'm not trying to put you on blast, but I think that this is instructive. Did you start, did you start out in the juvenile court system? I did. How old were you? Nine. Nine years old. You know, that does not surprise me. I, tragically, that does not surprise me. And what I want everybody in this audience to hear clearly is that we had an opportunity to intervene before he got in the system at nine. We had an opportunity again when he got in the system at nine. And we kept missing these opportunities to get him out of the system and onto a positive path. And so if we are opening our community centers, if we are opening our churches, if we're having, I am a huge proponent of after school programs, because I would rather you be in an after school program doing some good stuff than being recruited by a gang member or a drug dealer on the corner. And so, I, again, I, I'm not trying to, you know, put you on blast or anything, but I, I, I almost thought when you were talking that this road started when you were very young and that it continued for a good chunk of your life. There is a report um, that is done by uh, a book called Race, Incarceration, and American Values by Professor La Rosa Brown, economics professor. This is what he said. He said that nearly 60% of the black male high school dropouts born, when were you born? 1939. Who were born in the late 1960s, so you were a decade ahead, who were born in the late 1960s were in prison before they turned 40. And he goes on to talk about in this research what happened to these men when they came back to re-enter the community. Exactly what Professor Ogletree is talking about. It's the question of them being, you have a sense of hope, and obviously you're focused on what you want to do and what you want to focus for others, but there's a stigma. There is a, they are outside of the community. They can't, in a lot of situations, vote. They can't find a job. They don't have a place to live. And what he says that is so compelling, he goes on to say, and these are the men who should have been fathers and should have been anchors in our community, but they weren't there. And when they come back, it's hard for them to get reconnected. And so, and you are a living example of why I just encourage Congressman Scott all the time. You know, I always put an S on this promises. And I know it's the Youth Promise Act. I really do know it. You know, and I think subconsciously I keep putting an S like Youth Promises because I do see this as a whole range of promises. But what this does, Congressman, is that he's a living witness of a nine-year-old because this act is going to pass. Yeah, going we don't have a choice. Yeah. And when it passes, there will be a nine-year-old who will not be in the system. And so I appreciate you being here today because you are telling us why this has to happen. This, there's no other, there's not more compelling reason than for you to say, I have spent 23 years of my life in the system. 23 years of my life, when we needed you out in this community, being a contributing, vibrant citizen. And I'm telling you people, we got to be serious because there are a lot of nine-year-olds out here right today who are depending on us. That's right. I'm not just talking about the problem. And one of the things we're doing is that we're sending speakers into the schools to talk to students starting in third grade and to deal with the truancy and the dropout problem, and specifically geared to the comments fed before you. When a child is truant, or when a child drops out, we are sending our black professionals out to side of why, to provide counsel mentors, and where they're in gangs, we are using people like this gentleman here to be part of our rolling leader programs. Right. It's a twofer because we are taking inmates who have really seen the light and who turn their lives around. 
and giving them jobs and giving them second defenders days. Matter of fact, we tell the local governments, put your money where your mouth is and hire these people and give them jobs. We say we do that. And each youth, and we're developing programs where, once we play the confidence out, where a black boy at 13 or 14 drops out of high school, we will have people going out and being part of the retrieval to put that kid on the right track and to provide a black mentor to work for that kid from then to high school, maybe to a PhD degree, rather than spending 20 or 30 years in prison. So the point is, we are action oriented. You beyond talking about program. We are already implemented the Youth Project Society. Mm -hmm. mm. All right, Joe. But this uh, second chart is um, is a chart of African American males, 26 to 30, in 1970. When the purple is high school dropout, green is high school graduate. 1970, uh, you can get a job, wasn't much of a problem. Few in, in, in the street, few in jail. But by 2000, since we have an information-based a high-tech economy, if you don't have at least a high school education, and you actually need more than that, those who dropped out of school by the time they're 26 to 30, only 30% 30 of them can be found on a job, and more than that can be found today in jail. Mm. So once we let young people drop out of school, they're on a trajectory towards uh, building up the, those purple lines in the previous chart. So we need to keep them uh, in school so they don't drop out to begin with, and those that have dropped out, you got to get them back as quickly as possible. And they don't decide to drop out overnight. That's a continuum that starts probably around the third grade when they um, they can't read by the third grade. They're on a trajectory towards dropping out. So we have to start early, get them on the right track, keep them on the right track, and that's what the Youth Promises Act seeks to do. <laughs> Now he's saying you probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <hard. laughs> I write an S on my paper. <laughs> you might rename the X. Something. 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 Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ellen Wing from Orange, New Jersey, and I'm a licensed optician. To the point of Judge Hatcher, yes, you are right. There are many, many kids that can't see. And, and I mean, there are lots of them. And anyway, what, what I'm, I came up here to address that, but I also came up here to say something that's very important. I'm a single parent, and I'm a daughter of a single parent. My father was a physician. He died when I was a baby. I'm part of divorce like lots of folks. <laughs> and I have three children, two boys. And as a single parent, Raising my children, I can tell you this, um, especially when you have boys. But yes, I have a bachelor's degree, but I went back to school to train to be a licensed optician in New Jersey. And when I was in school, my children were five, seven, and nine. But I focused, and those children watched me as an example on my excellence. My example to them said, I don't care what your gender is, you are mine. I am going to lead, not by do well, do well in school, but I was their example. And as a single woman, and I went to school full time, and I worked 40 hours also, and had three little kids, thank God for my mother who helped me watch those children. But I came out with highest honors, as did, now my kids are saying to me, oh my God, mom really meant business. That's right, because I was the example. I, don't, I didn't accept mediocrity. Just because I'm a single parent, that's not the world's business. The expectation that I have for my children is you do your best, you be excellent. I have three children now who are over 20 years old, and one of them is that uh, he went to University of Pennsylvania undergrad, now he's in Temple University, and he's, he's in their academic scholarship. All he has to do is be in the top 50%, which is real hard for this boy today. But I have another child out of Rutgers 
who's taking care of his grandmother, my mother, and he's only 23, and he sees the necessity to support the family and to help. And then I have a child who is at Howard University who's a junior now. But what I can say is, as a single mom, that it was, and I live in Orange, New Jersey, which I love the town, that's, that's my heart. And I try, as an optician, to lead the other kids. I try to hire for my community. And I, I work in, in Livingston, New Jersey, which is like, you know, uh, about a half hour away with well-to-do people. I try to focus on those in my community and say, how can I help them? And I look at the eyeglasses these kids are, don't have them, they can't see, and they definitely need them, and I try to give them away to make sure we can do that. I also try to hire from my community. Unfortunately, what I'm getting that comes to me, these, they're not well trained. So I can't hire them because they're not ready, but I do go back and mentor. I try to give to them and say, listen, okay, you can't hire you this time, but that doesn't mean you can't be hired later. And I try to give back. The sad thing is, when we try to give, give this, give the free glasses, give the free exams, and I actually target the schools that have the kids that are underprivileged, it is not being utilized, which is really heartbreaking. I have had to, I go into the school, I don't know what else to do. I go and snatch them, come on kid. But it's heartbreaking because this is our future. So I still try to mentor. I talk about, I mean you think I own the company, I work for a huge company. But I'm, a, I'm an optician and I'm committed to the success of our people. I'm committed to, to be an example because most of the single mothers I know they have the problems with their kids who are in jail. They have a lot of issues, and I try to help them too. My number is listed. Nobody's number is listed. But. Well, let, let me suggest this. First of all, thank you um, for for your heart and your commitment. Let me suggest a couple of things. One, I think that your goodwill could be better utilized if you partnered with say, the local medical association, or that you worked with the department, whoever has the department of health services, so that it becomes a systemic kind of contribution, right. because obviously there are children who need what you're offering. But the bigger picture that I really want, and I'm so glad we talked about this, I got all these little notes here, um, is that 70% of, uh, our children are 70% more likely, let me get it right, our children are 70% more likely not to be insured. We give them. Well, no, but I'm just saying it's a bigger Sorry. problem because we don't have a lot of doctor views across the country. What we have got to do is we have got to get behind this president and we have got to make sure that there is a universal health care so that all children and families will have access to proper health care. Quickly, I have to tell you that we have to have our kids healthy, back to my original point, to be able to be productive in school. And that school productivity is a critical piece of their survival in this world, as the Congressman just showed us with this slide. So, it is, it is a, it is not, a isolated issue of 50% of our children dropping out nationally. Y'all hear me? 50% nationally. Mm -hmm. That if you go in and you can't read at third grade and you get further, further behind, dropping out is the only option. Right. We know that dropouts are more likely to be in prison. So what I'm saying is we have got to be very clear about the pieces that can help as we frame this conversation around the Youth Promises <laughs> Act, um, and that this health care is a critical piece of this. House version of the health 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 bill includes comprehensive uh, services for children, 
Uh, the technical term is EPSDT. It is a comprehensive plan that's in the Medicaid program. Uh, it's a state-of-the-art for children, includes vision and everything else. Um, that's in there because of the amendment I introduced in the Labor Committee. And if they don't take it out, children will be covered. It also includes mental health. Thank you, Representative Scott. Jennifer? I'm Jennifer Bellamy um, from the American Civil Liberties Union, and I just want to thank the panelists and the audience for such an engaging um, discussion that we've had so far. And I just have a two-part question. Um, one is to law enforcement uh, representatives, and the other is to Congressman Scott. Um, we talked about it a little bit before, and it's really um, encouraging to hear law enforcement support for prevention, but I just want to get you to talk a little bit about is there a need um, from your perspective for a bill with increased penalties? In other words, do we need that balanced approach that partners prevention with more penalties, or do you feel that the tools that you currently have as law enforcement are adequate to address youth violence? And then the other question is for Congressman Scott, if he feels that there is I guess the political climate or the political will to pass a bill that focuses, um, you know, primarily on prevention and intervention, or do we need that, um, you know, two-part approach that some people um, have supported in the past? I'll start first. I think the penalties are su sufficient, and in some cases, could be looked upon as being uh, too strong. As we talked about earlier today, um, when someone commits a, a crime, especially a juvenile, and the juvenile is then judged or, or taken through the court system and treated as an adult, you know, um, sometimes it has much more harmful effects as if that juvenile would, would be going through the juvenile system and, and, and then treated and giving, given the proper um, given the proper things that he or she would need to, uh, you know, to, to better him or herself. So I, I think it's sufficient and in some cases a little bit um, too strict. Um, and that's why I left the chart up here. Uh, you look at the international incarceration rates. Um, Russia is the only thing that's close to us. Uh, we're at 700 per 100,000. Pew Research Forum concluded anything over 500 was actually counterproductive. Uh, for somebody looking at that chart to suggest that I see the problem, we're not locking up enough black people. Most of the, I mean, the, the alternative gang bill, uh, we went through the code sections in which penalties were being enhanced yeah. and found that between, depending on which code section it was, between two-thirds and three-fourths of the people prosecuted under those sections were minorities. That's right. Which means that if the bill passed, that chart would look worse. Um, so to suggest that uh, we need more penalties in light of the fact that we're already over the counterproductive 500 level, anything over 500 is counterproductive. African Americans are at 2,200 already. Uh, 10 states, 4,000, and they don't have any better criminal justice results uh, wasting that kind of money. When, if you put that money into prevention, we went through 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 this, you could save in those 10 states $10,000 per child per year and targeted money to one third of the children. So you can spend $10,000 a year per child for at, at risk children for prevention, or you can continue a counterproductive strategy that does everybody knows doesn't work. Now, your question is just on the politics of it. Uh, can a crime bill pass if it is not decorated with racially discriminatory waste of taxpayers' money? Um, that's the choice that we make. We choose whether we're going to play politics or uh, reduce crime. And uh, maybe we do need some racially discriminatory nonsense to decorate the bill and make people feel better. I think the, the politics of it will change. You have things like if you do the adult crime, you do the adult time. That runs about 80% of the polls. Everybody that studies it knows that it increases the crime rate. As, as, uh, as Glenda said, I mean, it, it, more likely to commit a crime, more likely to be committed sooner, more likely to be violent. I mean, everybody knows that. Those are, those are facts. At best, it does nothing. At worst, it makes things worse. Okay, I come out against it, and I'm on the defensive. What's that all about? Mm. Why isn't somebody who votes for the foolishness 
put on, you know, what, what are you, an idiot? I mean, does anybody vote for that? Has anybody who voted for that ever been called an idiot? No, I'm called soft on crime. I don't have any problem with it. Because, you know, first debate we talk about crime, I pointed my opponent, after he called me soft on crime, I pointed my opponent and say that my opponent will vote for any simple-minded slogan or soundbite, even if it will increase crime, if his pollster tells him it'll help him get elected. And I can prove it. Now let's talk about crime policy. You know, we go through that, and the uh, next meeting they go back to, well, my respects for raise your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> We have about one debate on crime policy, and that, that I just shut them down. Um, but, I mean, that, it, it's a public. The public puts up with this. People vote for programs known to increase the crime rate, and the people that try to reduce the crime rate are the ones on the defensive. When the public changes, the politics will change. Thank you very much. Two are three, and no one else get up and stand behind this young man right there. I need our three remaining folks to be considerate of each other. Because according to the clock, we have six minutes left. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cynthia Robbins, and I will be brief. I have had the privilege of actually talking with a couple of the panelists and several people in here. I would have actually just uh, addressed two questions or, or points, really. Um, one is that we're in the District of Columbia, where just right now we're in a battle to save the only diversion program for young people. Um, I think we are winning, but it has been a battle all this week. Uh, there's something called the Time Dollar Youth Court, which has proven with a $450,000 annual budget to be able to save the District of Columbia some $8 million that would be spent to actually prosecute the young people instead of putting them through a peer jury process where they have to assess their decision making, take life skills, and become more accountable for their behavior, understand the court system and their decision making, not be idle. So it, it is alive and well, and it probably in the communities where you all live, uh, these kinds of issues are on our front and center. So it is important that the voters and the electorate stay vigilant as your decision makers are determining where resources are going to be spent and where they're going to be cut. Because in the name of trying to save a few dollars, what you end up doing is creating a context where the district could end up spending millions more. Um, I have actually co-authored a law review piece that I hope will be an, a tool to communities around the country uh, in addressing the issue of uh, juvenile justice and civil rights. Uh, there is a disproportionate rate of incarcerating young people of color that is unequivocally clear. There is injury that results from it. Our whole community is less well served. And um, we think we now can prove that there is intentional discrimination as a result of the fact that they choose from among these known alternatives. I do take issue with the notion that we have to have evidence-based alternatives because I think Jim Brown said it, but it's certainly true, it's harder to gather the data. You don't have the resources to gather the data. Um, so for anyone who lives in a community where you might be willing to have a notice hearing to put your officials on notice of the wonderful alternatives that are community-based and, and then create a mandate that they choose them, that the officials choose them, please see me afterwards. And I have a copy of the, alternate, of the article. It's coming out of the UGC Law Journal uh, this fall. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, that that um, law review article is uh, part of the hearing record in the last uh, Youth Promises Act uh, uh, hearing we had. It's uh, very good because it shows that when you choose to inappropriately put people in, to children into detention, they get off on the wrong trajectory. And if that uh, damage done to the children is done in a racially discriminatory way, uh, you have a, uh, a severe civil rights problem. Even if it's not done in a, in a uh, discriminatory way, you got a civil rights problem. But the fact that it's applied in a racially discriminatory way, when there are cheaper alternatives with better results, and we'll staring you in the face, uh, that's a problem. But on the question of evidence-based, um, we, we, there's a debate about what is evidence-based and what isn't. The uh, point we're making is it's evidence-based, intelligence-based, rather than uh, political and slogan-based. 
Thank you. Is it online? Can we access the article online? Uh, yes, you can actually. I mean, that might be helpful. It might be an easier. You can way access to the draft at www.tbusa.org, which stands for TimeBanksUSA.org slash hearing. And the, and the article is called, An Offer They Can't Refuse, Racial Disparity in Juvenile Justice and Deliberate Indifference Meet Alternatives That Work. It's a mouthful. But an offer they can't refuse. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I have a two-part question. I'm going to make it really quick. Um, one of the questions is posed to Congressman Scott, and then the next is to Major Green. My name is Xavier Williams. I'm the grant manager for the Department of Human Services uh, for Safety Networks in Illinois. So re I'm an ex-offender. I'm the gentleman he was talking about. But I'm a soldier, most of all. So I don't have all my hoodies. I am Chicago. Images impact your perception because I have on a suit. People are telling me, well, you don't look like you did 20 years. Well, I never knew I could survive 20 years till I was put there. But in coming home, you know, so when we say re-entry, I never hear the real issues that we're dealing with in there, such as medical assistance. After one Tylenol, we have to pay, you know, proper access to legal facilities. We don't have that anymore. We cannot apply for habeas corpuses in there anymore. And there's undetected symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's why I say I'm a soldier, because when you come home, you feel shock, your nerves, and certain things stimulate it, it, it causes a certain reaction. And our kids are living in an environment that has undetected PTSD. We're hearing a lot now about protective factors. So my question to you gentlemen is, are you open for independent evaluations to be done by trained individuals from the population group that you're serving, meaning for the Youth Promise Bill? We're organizing youth under my program, so I, I'm shattering stigmas. As I said, I give out the grants in Chicago. So where the youth have identified, they want to develop a monitoring tool to ensure that the CBOs are doing what they need to do. Basically, they feel like they're getting exploited and pimped. So they want to make sure that the service provider, they're like, Xavier, were they supposed to tell us about the budget? Xavier, were they supposed to do this? We all say collaboration networks and coalition building, but it's money grabbing. So I'm asking to ensure that there's an equilibrium, right? That there's a balance, a stopgap mechanism. Are you guys open to have youth or ex-offenders that are properly trained, not just any youth, that are properly trained to do independent evaluation? That ensures that you're providing the needed services that your target population needs. That's my door. Yes. When you get the community together to come up with a plan, it is, you can't right. have a plan that doesn't include the people that are actually doing the work. I mean, the second chance is already in a place, and whoever's doing reentry, who's helping people and identifying the problems, it's just hard to imagine. And one of the things, let me just, just, just say that we, we do not specify which programs will be funded under the Youth Promise Act. That is because it has to be locally tailored. Tailored to the locality, first you've got to figure out what your problems are and what your resources are. Some may have resources in some areas and not others. Some may have very good programs over here but not over there. Another, another city, just the opposite. So you have to uh, go through and figure out what your problems are, what your resources are, and come up with and we call it evidence-based. Some people have uh, technical problems with what you, what you call it, but a plan which you can reasonably expect to have a significant uh, impact on crime. And there's so many programs out there that uh, it, it's really not that hard to put together a comprehensive plan. It has to be comprehensive, and because the first number you put out there is how much money you're spending on prisons. Um, and you can spend, in some areas, up to $10,000 per child per year is what you're wasting in counterproductive um, incarceration. Uh, you shouldn't be shy on coming up with a comprehensive program. And certainly mental health um, and medical assistance for uh, people returning with the, re with the recidivism rate we've got, you don't have to spend a lot of money 
to start showing significant uh, uh, returns on your investment. Make sure you're going to save more money than you spend. Somebody going back to prison has cost you so much, so everyone you don't that doesn't go back is such a benefit to the to the bottom line that these kinds of programs that you mentioned really would, would virtually have to be in a program, but we're not demanding it because some some cities have entirely different uh, problems and different resources than others. And I just want I just want to take two seconds to put this in perspective too. So we talk about the actual numbers. Uh, this, this it says that the average annual per child cost of a mentoring program is a thousand bucks. Thousand dollars. Who put that in perspective? We it would cost us for high quality after school programs. $2,700. Head Start annually would be $7,000. But we spend, on average, every year per prisoner, $22,650. Wow, $22,650. $22, it says the states spend, on average, almost three times as much per prisoner that we spend on per pupil in our public school system. That is an outrageous, I'm trying to stop cursing because I know we're on the record. <laughs> but it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous and we have really, you know, as we talk about how we invest, I think the Congressman is wise in having drafted this in a way that it has to be, um, it has to be generic to these communities that it cannot be superimposed on the communities, but it has to be organic. That's the word I'm trying to think. I, I say organic. this as a, as, a, as a funder. If we don't have like community capacity building training institutes I don't disagree that requires that. that the community are trained, oftentimes they're posturing like they know what they're doing. There's a generational disconnect. So they get the money and the youth are not in your program. So I hear your numbers. But if they're not coming in the door, they're going to be in the street. Guess who's always out there for them? So, and what I'm saying to you, I went to South Africa because I know it's always evidence-based practice, right? So I went there and applied this evaluation program there in Johannesburg and Cape Town. And it's still operating now. So I'm just trying to see, can this be written into the grant? Because if it's not mandated, and wrapped around the money, I fear that it won't be done when it gets to me on the state level. I may be able to help you with the solution. The president of the Cook County Bar is working with me in Chicago. We have a, a group on ground opportunity connecting with them and this gentleman right. here. And you may have a program where you have teenage counselors and you will be on the inside. Right. I mean, I guess. I'm going to ask the final two gentlemen if you could each ask your question, make your comment, and then I'm gonna let the panel respond to both of you because we are already over time and I'm concerned that there may be another panel trying to get into this room. So, okay. yes sir. I'm Terrence Sibby James from the University of Georgia. Uh, three quick questions. What's the total cost of this of the Youth Promise Act? Second question, what measures are in place to, um, what are methods are in place to measure the effectiveness of the Youth Promise Act? And were there any youth uh, that actually were involved in the juvenile justice system that uh, had some influence in the formulation of this act. Thank you, thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, Judge Hatch, the uh, comments you made a little while ago about, you know, gave that statistic about the um, youth who were, well, I guess not youth anymore, but folks who were born in the late 60s. Um, you know, I started to do some math in my head, and I know that, um, you know, the, the incarceration rate, uh, is, there's several different factors, but here's the math I did. Okay, in 1968, if a person was born, this was right around the birth of the Black Panther Party, which came out of the Black Liberation Movement as a whole. Not too long after that, J. Edgar Hoover, who was the, uh, the, the head of the FBI at the time, was quoted as saying that, uh, a black panther is born in the ghetto every minute or every 30 seconds or something to that effect, right? So, to his perception, and quite possibly because there was this positive force in the community, anybody born in 1968 would likely get sucked up into it. Ten years later, in 1978, because of the uh, uh, counterintelligence program and, and, and other things that was put in place by the intelligence community, the Black Panther Party was gone. 
as was many other elements of the Black Liberation Movement and the Civil Rights Movement. Gangs had taken their place. Uh, Congressman Scott, I think you were at the, uh, the showing of the film Crips and Bloods Made in America on Capitol Hill uh, a few months back, which uh, you know showed how gangs kind of filled this vacuum that was created when uh, these elements of the Black Liberation Movement have been uh, you know, dealt with at the hands of the FBI and the oh, Comitel Pro and the, the Senate, the, the, known as the Church Committee hearings in 1973, documented that uh, the FBI had gone through these lengths and had done many illegal acts in their objectives to destroy uh, this movement. The same child in 1978, okay, now let's go to 1988, he's 20. At this point, crack is rampant in the streets. And there's also evidence to show that the intelligence community was involved with this phenomenon of crack cocaine that occurred in, in, in our communities. So um, this stuff that we're dealing with here, um, one of the factors that has given rise to these statistics is the illegal acts of the intelligence community, which even after having been identified individuals and agencies, no one was ever held accountable. Imam Jamil Alamin, who worked with this brother here, Khalid Samad, who I know that you've worked with, and the work that they did in the 90s with the gang summits, um, laid the groundwork for this type of legislation. So um, I think that, that he's owed some credit, and I would encourage some investigation done in his case as an example of cases of other political prisoners. I would also say that after this bill passes, that Looking at this as kind of a, a bandage on a wound, you know, when you get wounded, you got to go to the hospital. You take, do what you can, then you go to the hospital, and then you get it really taken care of. As long as the government and its agencies can feel confident that they can commit these types of illegal acts on us and in our communities without any kind of retribution or without being held accountable, we're talking about this now, 20 years from now, they're going to be talking about something else that my daughter's generation is dealing with. And the final thing, um, this here also is an example of uh, human rights abuse, um, to my estimation. In the United States, as well as the conditions of the prisons that these folks find themselves in, so that they're getting ushered in there in alarming rates, and then when they get in there, they aren't treated fairly. Um, I would say it's an Eighth Amendment violation, which is cruel and unusual punishment, which the United States does adhere to what the United States has not signed and ratified any international human rights treaty legislation such as the uh, uh, International Bill of Rights. The only one that they did sign was the International Covenant of uh, Civil and Political Rights, but they did that with five reservations and they refrained from signing the two optional protocols which would have allowed for uh, uh, the, the abolishment of the death penalty, and also for United States citizens to take their cases against the United States to the International Criminal Court. So I think that's another thing that needs to be addressed, you know, following this, that the United States signs and ratifies these human rights treaties, that the intelligence community is held accountable for what they've done to us, and that for those of us who some would consider the best of us, these political prisoners who did whatever they could in their communities, but were punished for it by the hands of the government. Those of us who consider ourselves activists in the community and are trying to do stuff as long as the intelligence community can get away scot-free with dealing with us in these types of illegal fashions, all of us are at risk. That's right. Thank you. Let me respond to a couple of questions. Some of them are a subject of, uh, of other panels, so I'm not going to go into any depth, but on the human rights violation, if we noticed that another country was locking up uh, an ethnic minority, their population, at, this, at these kinds of rates, uh, our State Department would consider it a human rights violation. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, people joining gangs, um, the, um, what this bill does is gives them an alternative to those gangs, and, um, and, and hopefully uh, the gangs won't be able to recruit because so people are so busy uh, staying in school, going to college, and don't want to ruin their lives by joining gangs. Uh, the question was asked how much uh, money technically the, the bill uh, provides for what's called such sums as may be appropriated. 
Uh, that is to say, there's no specific amount, whatever gets appropriated. There is, this is uh, what's called an authorization bill. Most people learn the difference between authorization and appropriation with no child left behind because we had a great authorization, which is permission to appropriate, but when the money committee started, they didn't appropriate all of the money that had been authorized. Uh, so rather than go through that trick, we just said whatever we can get, um, get appropriated. Uh, we expect the planning grants and somebody uh, plan some of these planning, you got to do a lot of research, getting the numbers, doing the research, coming up with the plan, a lot of technical assistance. Uh, grants would be expected to be in the $300,000 per applicant level. For those that um, uh, put a plan together on a priority basis, that is where there's the most problems and the best plan, uh, we expect to be able to fund plans in the five to $10 million range per plan. This is not just citywide, this might just be a neighborhood. If you've got a bad enough problem and, and you got a number on the table, you're spending 80, $100 million in incarceration, uh, and you've got a nice $10 million plan that might cut that in half, that puts you uh, up on the list. I, I remind people that when we have snow removal grants, uh, <laughs> Come on, sir. Uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and Miami, Florida don't get the same amount of money. <laughs> so we're going to put the money where the worst problems are, the best, uh, best uh, solutions uh, will be. And uh, how much does it cost? Uh, you know, it's, um, I think any young one was asked, how's your wife? His response was, compared to what? <laughs> uh, compared in a community with 100,000 compared with spending $100 million a year on incarceration, let's spend some of that money on uh, prevention and early intervention. And before uh, terror, we a Christian, I, mean, uh, I want to introduce uh, the staff. Christian Haynes is about to walk out. He's been working on the uh, Youth Promise Act. As well as Carol. Carol. Kara Shaka uh, actually came up with the name uh, Youth Promise Act, uh, uh, Prison Reduction Through Opportunities, Mentoring, Intervention, uh, support. support, and Education Act. That was uh, Carol's idea. Uh, David Daly is in the uh, Washington office, and Bobby Vassar is uh, Chief Counsel of the Crime Subcommittee. I give them a hand because they've been very well. Tara does, I want to thank our panelists. This has been an all-star panel. And in closing, I just want to thank all of you for coming, for staying, for participating. Um, I know that there are a lot of questions, some of which are not going to be addressed through this legislation, but which create avenues to address some of those larger, more systemic issues. And so again, if you have an organization um, I love you, but we really have an organization. You've got an organization um, that you want to bring, the power of your organization. I don't care how informal your organization, I don't care how small you may think it is or others may perceive it. If you have a base and you want to bring it in support of this um, ad, please see me after this panel so we can exchange information and make sure that we make that connection. Again, a big hand for Representative Scott for introducing the